Welcome, Sister Dr. Julia here. All town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, thank you so much for that. You know, it is only in New York. See, it, it, the other places around the country are just there. You know, they often said that California and New York are there. You know, the rest of the country just holds the two places together. But let me tell you, the energy really comes out of here, and the blackness comes out of here, because when brothers and sisters move out to California, as you well know, something happens to them. When they go to Berkeley, which we call Berserkly, you also understand they become multicultural and people of color, and they can become everything but blackness. Then when they come to San Francisco, that's the city of whatever your sexual preference might be. And then when they're down in Los Angeles, they get false notions, you know, that they're all in Hollywood or whatever it might be, and they tend to forget that the togetherness and the blackness. Because had any group of people hassled a group of black people in California the way they did you when you were the slave, and then you got up, you didn't even fall on your backs, but you got up and went to another location, and here you are today. Most groups would not have survived. They would not have been able to handle that. And because, and the reason why you're here tonight is because you have survived, because, and that means that you're threatening somebody and doing something right. Because. Have you noticed that the groups who were after you and the slave, and after all of us all over this world, but especially after you and the slave, you notice they're not after Third Baptist Church on Sundays. They're not after Abyssinia. They're not after any of those churches. See, they're not after places that are not threats to them. But when they believe that black people get together who are determined to understand that they're not going to be controlled by their inferiors, then they're ready to deal with us. And this is the type of problem that we have going on. That's why I'm so happy to see what is going on here. And I know that this is our Women's History Month, but as I told you before when I was here, and even on WLIB this week, I'm just an advocate for brothers and sisters, because I do believe that whatever sisters are, brothers got to be that with us. Whatever the brothers are, they have to be it with us. And that way we, we raise strong warriors, young males and females, to take our places and to continue the legacy that we have. And so we're going to get into why we're doing that. I was so very, very pleased. You know, you don't read in the paper sometimes about what Brother Alton Maddox is doing in the slave theater because the major paper that comes to our coast, to San Francisco from here, I think you all call it the uh, New York Times, but out there we call it the Daily Hebrew. And so that is the paper. That is the only one that comes out there. And every morning when we read the Hebrew, it doesn't be telling us that people like Brother Maddox has gone to court and cross-examined himself. And you know, dogs, these things don't come out there. They really don't come out there. They don't tell us about what the slave theater has done and how it has moved from place to place and how it still remains black. You may be the only organization in this country that has been able since the 60s to remain black. You may be the only. You may be the only. And you know, that is a sad commentary on our peace, uh, on our people, that anybody else can remain whatever they want to be. You know, the Irish can have what they have, the Italians got St. Patrick's Day, the Jews have theirs, you know, you, you just go down the line. But whenever black folk get together, somehow they're just going to become afraid that we are there to do what they would do if they were in our place. And that is, that if they, if we, if they had been oppressed, as long as they have oppressed us, they would be naturally afraid for, to meet because we would wonder what are they going to do. So they really believe that we are vindictive, evil people and would give them exactly what they deserve and perhaps one day we will. Perhaps one day we will come to that point. I hope that this is the thing. And I'm certainly happy to tell you that our leader here, Brother Maddox, who's not with us tonight, remains one of the most perceptive. I think he remains one of the most articulate and one of the outspoken critics of racism in this country. Because let me tell you, the brother's voice has not been silenced because some corporations ask him to come and settle disputes and he ends up with more than the black employees and do I need to call any names? You all know how this kind of thing happens. Brother's voice has not been silenced because not only did they give him a steak, they are now buying him out with hamburgers and french fries, whatever it takes to do that. Brother's voice is now being heard on our coast and also in Africa, which I think is very, very important. And one of the reasons why I'm always happy to come to this organization because you're the only one, you're the only black organization, again, that understands to put race first. Race first. 
race first. And I've had some white folks to tell me that I was a flaming militant, a radical, or whatever all of these names were that they called me. And I said that I am very pleased that you've called me a nationalist because you could have said that I was a member of the NAACP of the Urban League. So I said, I'm very pleased of the names that you have given. But I said that because we put race first, something is wrong with us. But everybody else puts their own first because God blessed the child who has his own. And so I think that race first is very important. And though we meet in a different venue, we're not at the slave theater, we're not at the church, we're now at the Masonic temple, it really does not matter where we are physically. It matters where we are in our minds. And wherever we meet, as long as we know that we're Africans and as long as we know that we are black people living here in America, we know exactly who we are. You notice you can put an Uncle Tom in any venue in the White House, you can even put him in his, he'll still be a Tom. You can put them anywhere you want. Well, it's the same thing with us who are strong people. Wherever we are, we're going to be the people that we need to be. And I know that this is our Women's History Month, and that's why I'm certainly happy to see sisters. And this is the only place you can come in this country where you don't find a room full of sisters who are still sitting here waiting to exhale. Can you imagine something like that? Be sitting here waiting to exhale. Because we know we have exhaled ever since we came through the middle passage of the Holocaust of our enslavement, and I'm glad to see that. This is the only place you can come where you'll see that these sisters are true mothers of the universe. See, a lot of folks wonder who are the mothers and who gave life to every living creature, but we know we are the mothers. I realize we don't always like to claim our children because who always wants to claim Whoopi Goldberg and Dennis Rodman? But we do know that as the mothers of the universe, sometimes we have to do that. I'm happy to come before the sisters of Isis and the sisters of Nefertiti and the sisters of Nzinga and the sisters of Harriet Tubman and the reason why I say Harriet Tubman, the way you've had to move from one location to another, it reminds me of Harriet Tubman. When Sister led that Underground Railroad, some of us, when she got about three, four, five, a hundred of us out, do you know some of those Negroes wanted to turn around and run back into slavery because they were so happy and so pleased with the master taking care of them? Sister put her hand on the hip and said, I'll shoot you myself before I let you turn around and run back into something like this. She made that very, very clear to them exactly what she would do to them. You also came from Sister Ida B. Wells, who drew the attention to this world, not just to this country, of the unnecessary lynchings of black men in the 19th century. That white men were doing things they should have been lynched five times over for, but instead they wanted to lynch the brother. She's the one who brought the attention. Then there's our Sada Shakur, and not to mention our own dear Queen Mother Moore, that I hope that we always remember, our sisters of her. And so to the women in this room that I know that you have worked hard, I know you have persevered, I know you have to put up with a lot of stuff. Because I know when a lot of women sit on television talking about there is a glass ceiling, they don't know if their faces were black, the ceiling would be mahogany, and you cannot move a mahogany ceiling. But to those of you who have survived and persevered and stood by our people, stood by our men, stood by our families, and stood by our communities, and most importantly our race, let's give ourselves a round of applause. Let us do that. Let us do that. And to our brothers that are in this room, and I mean genuine brothers, and I probably, before I get to these brothers, and probably should have said that before the sisters, I'm welcoming sisters and brothers here, but I also want to welcome the infiltrators that may be in our midst tonight, because you know that they're here. You know that they're here. And the only thing that I ask when you report to your master, please spell my name correctly, is J-U-L-I-A-H-A-R-E. This is it. And to those who are not sure that they're going to have race first or that they're black first tonight, let us make you honorary Negroes, whichever it is that you choose to be. But as black men, the reason why I'm so happy to see you, I'm happy to see the first men who also walked this, first, this earth and the first to truly establish, establish a civilization. They now want us to say that the Greeks did it and some, well, we all know all the names they've given, but you were absolutely the first, of course, with our help. You were the first to build institutions because as Marcus Garvey told us that it is our business to continue to build institutions and by doing that you still have people, white scientists, wondering how you built one of the only seven wonders of the world, the pyramids are still standing, that's got them stymied and wondered how did it get up there. And you can believe that every day as we speak that they're still trying to find out how that happened. I'm happy to come before brothers who have to build governments in this country, and this is what we're looking at. And because you have done so well, you will also always be genetically represented in the black child when you have stood for something. And I also know that it is not easy being the brother of David Walker, who absolutely gave us our first mission statement in the 19th century. I know it is not easy being a black man because everybody wants a piece of the black man in this world. Everybody wants a piece of the black male. 
white man wants a piece of him, and you know his woman wants a piece of the black man. So you know it just goes all over. So I know it is not easy being one because we know that as a black male you pose a threat in the bedroom and the boardroom to the white man. Wish you would stop posing it in his bedroom, but anyway, you do pose a threat both ways, and he understands that very, very carefully. And so to all the brothers in this room who have also stood for something, who have also fought, to all the brothers in here who are not insane, because it must be difficult to be a black man walking down the street with everybody scared of you that you haven't become totally schizophrenic. So to all of those who have remained true to the cause and the legacy of blackness, let's give these brothers a round of applause. Let us do this. Let us do this. Thank you for this. And our common goal tonight is to see sisters during this month that we are calling Women's History Month. Although we know Black History Month is very important to us, we took this month. And I hope that eventually we're going to call for a Black Males Month and a Black Women's Month. And if we're careful enough, we'll spread that out from September to June till we get all the months in the year and let white folks have to wonder what months are left. So this is what we're going to do. I know that our common goal tonight, I hope, is that we will understand that we must move ourselves as black women and our race into the 21st century. And the reason why I say move into the 21st century, do you know there are three more years before we have to do this? And people just keep going right along. Now, we in this room are going right along, putting up a struggle. But you know, most of our people are content to live with a veil of ignorance over their faces, even those that know better. And so we won't go into the bourgeois right now. We're going to call their names a little bit later. But as it stands now, we know that the struggle it is for you to help us to move into the 21st century. And I know many of you have been doing that every day. You've been reaching out in the community, you've been politicizing, you've been teaching, you've been going to public schools, you're working wherever you can. But sometimes you don't always get the credit that you deserve. So why don't you take a moment to turn to the person who is seated to your right. And it doesn't matter whether you know them because if you're black, you know them anyway because you've had the same experiences. So turn to the person seated to your right, men and women. It may even be your significant other by the time the night's over. So turn to the person who is seated to your right and tell them, tell them exactly what you have been doing to bring us into the 21st century. Who you've taught, the people that you've reached out to, folks you've done things for, people that you've given money to, and I didn't say to Bloomingdale's and to department stores, but people that you've actually helped. Now if I don't see you taking 30 seconds to tell it to somebody, I'm gonna know you've done nothing. So would you take about 30 seconds, and if you haven't done something, then tell them what you think you might do next week to help somebody. You have 20 seconds, because T and I took out 19, 18, 17, 16, what is that? 15, okay, 14, our time is just about up. Don't bother about that. I'm just going to throw these over. Okay. Okay. Just about up. And you've done all of that. Okay. Our time is over. Our time is up. You know, I'll bet there were some fantasies and some concoctions that went on out there. But if you haven't done what you said you were going to do, then you have next week to begin to do that. But as Sarah Russell told me that we were going to be talking about tonight, black women facing the 21st century, I said, this is very, very important because see, when you start talking centuries, people think that you got a whole century to get to it. We're talking about three more birthdays, uh, three more uh, raises, or three more vacations, whatever it might be, before we enter the 21st century. And let me tell you why our founders are facing some tough times. See, some people believe that life is like it is on television with the Cosby family. Some people think that all women go through life just hoping to one day to be a, a Stedman's uh, love interest and this kind of thing. Most women do not do that. We have difficult times because we, we recognize there are tough times ahead. And the reason why I said that, you do know that if anybody's going to save the black family, are you now with me convinced that it's going to have to be us? It's just going to have to be us. There are some people who are still saying, oh, the government will save us. Well, the government is part of the problem. How are they going to actually save us from anything? And if you're part of the problem, you certainly can't be a part of a solution. The government has already said that one out of four black babies that are not even born, not to mention those that are born, will end up in jail. Now, how is a government that makes those type of predictions going to help us? You know the Democrats cannot help us, but I know 95% of you probably think the Democrats will help us, but I know that 100% of you know the Republicans will not help us. 
And some of you who have gotten a little bit angry with the brothers and forgotten who your sisters are and forgotten to look in the mirror, you may even think that white feminists like Gloria Allred, Denise Brown, and Madeleine Albright will help us. But you know those women are not going to help us even if they could. T did they help us when their husbands raped us on the plantations? Did they help us when their husbands brought domestic violence against us on the plantations? See, this is what a lot of people do not look at. Those women are out for themselves and we'll get into them also a little bit later. So only the black man and only the black woman are the ones who will save black people and we should stop depending upon anyone else. Let me, let me show you some of the things we're facing. White folks were surprised to see the racial polarization that took place after that first O.J. Simpson jury came in. They were just like, they had no idea that we could even feel. They did not know, first of all, we believed that the prosecution, Marsha Clark, with a polyester wearing self, did not prove the case. We understood that from the very, very beginning. But then we also understood that this was much bigger to us than O.J. Simpson. We know O.J. Simpson is hopeless and helpless. And so we had no intentions of even dealing with someone like that. We were going, we were seeing our fathers, our brothers, and everybody else that we knew. And so they were surprised to see that it was at an all-time high. They are surprised to see that black folks are not surprised that affirmative action is being taken away. Because don't they take away everything else? First of all, affirmative action started to have reparations for those who had been left out. And reparations meant black folks because the Japanese got their reparations and they weren't in the concentration camps for four years. And we were in there 400 and didn't get ours. Germany gave reparations to the Jews and you can go all the way down the line. But when it came time for our reparations, affirmative action, the reason why you don't hear white females saying anything, because 80% of the jobs under affirmative action went to them plus pushing us to the back burner and bringing inflation up. This is the kind of thing that happened, the reason why we're not surprised at anything they do. We're facing turbulent times because as we speak tonight, they're in the process of changing the jury system. They are determined that there will never be a predominantly black jury that will free anybody accused of murdering white folks, even if they are trash. It does not matter to them. This is what they're not going to have happen. So now they're making plans that they only need two or three to either hang a jury or two or three to let the person walk. That's all because of us. It's not because of other people. Because, see, nothing makes me angrier when we talk about our civil rights and what we've missed. That here comes the Asians in to join us. Here come the Latinos in talking about their civil rights. Here comes white women in talking about theirs, the Mexicans, all of these people. And I don't know, some of you are very, very young, but in my experience growing up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I never knew that anybody who was sent to the back of the bus because she was a white woman. Nobody was sent to the back of the bus because they were homosexual. Nobody was sent to the back of the bus because they were Asian and Latin. They were sent to the back of the bus because their faces were black. And now all of these groups are wanting to come in now and take the things that owe us. And some of our leaders stand up there and say, oh, we're all one. We should include everyone that's going in. Every time I hear them do that, I just want to pick up a sock, a shoe or something and throw it at the television. See, this is why I'm not mistaken by these leaders. See, anytime, first of all, you can't lead me when you call an organization rainbow because there's no black in a rainbow, as you all always know. And then they were amazed to know that we were shocked. We, it didn't, we were shocked to know the white folks were surprised to know when the San Jose Mercury News broke the story of the CIA and putting drugs in our community. It didn't surprise us. I don't know why white folks knew that we didn't have any airplanes and boats and all those things to come in here. But the only thing that just disturbed me about it was I was sorry that a black newspaper could not once in a while broken a story like that. They're surprised to know that we're sick of public school education and that we equate public schools with prisons because they're both running the business of incarcerating our children to keep them off the streets until they're old enough to be sent to some other place. Pediatricians have now said, and speaking of black children, that gun violence is now the epidemic of the 90s. And this is why I'm saying, sisters, there are some things that we have got cut out for us because you cannot depend upon the coalitions or your co-workers or your friends unless your co-workers' faces are black and they have been politicized just as you have. The Center for Disease Control have told us that most black children are going to get killed in school or even near the school. And yet when we decide that we want to have our own private schools, the white liberals will come crawling out from under the woodwork telling us that we're separating ourselves in this kind of segregation. You remember in Detroit when they wanted to have a school for all black boys? And here comes all of these folks out of here, the, the types that you know are not our friends, the Gloria Steinems and all, coming out talking about it was discriminating against our girls. And see, when that didn't work, they said that then we'll find a black person. Have you noticed white folks can always find a black person to come and do their biddings against us? Can always find one. 
and they made a mistake to find a sister to come out against Julia here on CNN. And I told the sister during the break, I said, now you have your opportunity to either side with me or go home embarrassed to death. You have your choice to do whichever one you want to do. I said, because if you side with the white folks today, I'm going to treat you just like them. I said, because this is what has happened when on the slave plantations, whenever we had any meetings and there was an insurrection there, it was usually a black person who told them because white folks were not at the planning meeting. And I said, they're going to do the same thing to you as they did to the others. Once they pushed us into the river, whatever it was for trying to get away, they kicked the person in there who went back to tell them. So I said, you got your choice, and we're going to give you a countdown to three. Sister got on there just singing right along with me, and knowing she didn't agree with me, but I told her, but you had your choice to either face me here or go home and face your community, either one that you chose to choose. You have to do that to them. And the reason why I say this, we're going to really have to start holding black people accountable, and somehow we're afraid to do that. We put them in office, we're afraid to, to hold them accountable, because what they do, then they run for office, they come to groups like this, they go to all the black churches and they speak, and they have us out there selling fish dinners and chicken dinners and doing the chitlin strut and everything we can to raise money to get them in. And once they get in the office, they say, oh, I'm not an officer, I'm not the mayor of black people, I'm the mayor of all people. And see, I have a problem with that, because first of all, a serious revolutionary will not and does not even wish to become an elected official. I'm telling you about a serious revolutionary. Because you cannot do that because you have to serve two masters, and I think we were all taught you cannot serve two masters at one time. Because once you get into office, if you are not serving the folks who have bankrolled you, you are either going to be recalled, assassinated, or put out. Now, I'm not telling you not to vote for black folks, and I think that you should do that. Anytime a black person is, is, is running for office, vote for them, but don't expect for them to be your leader if you want to get liberation and go to freedom. You will always work with them, but your leaders cannot be elected officials, just like the white folks' leaders are not elected officials. You really don't think that Bill Clinton is running anything, do you? That's just the elected official. You really don't think those cabinet members are running their communities. They are elected officials. The business people and the scholars and the people like us who do all the thinking out here, that's who's running them and calling the shots. In other words, when we have elected officials, they are the puppets who should be out there dancing, but we are the puppeteers who should be pulling those strings, telling them what to say. And if they don't say those things, if you don't dance to those strings, then we're going to have to pull the strings and pull you off the stage. People were also very surprised that we were not shocked that Texaco came out and made that statement about the jelly beans. The only thing that we were shocked at is if somebody reported them. Because we know this type of stuff goes on all the time in every corporate headquarters that goes on. We know that now that they're telling us that we need to register to vote and go out and do all of this, we're in serious trouble. And I, the reason why I said that I know the sisters are going to help us to lead this, but brothers, you will be with us too. The only reason why I'm saying pushing us out there, not only is it because it's Women's History Month, I found out that white folks are not so quick to come and throw us in the jail as they are the brothers. This is why we had to put Rosa Parks on the bus. This is why some things we may be able to get out there and do. Now, you are warriors. And once we knock on the door, then you'll come and kick it in and push it open. So there is a role for each of us that we have to do. But since they have said that 14% of black men cannot vote in this country because they are convicted felons. You know, any black man in this country is amazing that they're not a convicted something, you know, if they wanted to survive. But that means about one million brothers in this country cannot vote. And yet, when they tell them that they can't vote because they were accused of something, Richard Nixon was able to vote up until his death. You know, the Whitewater people are still voting every day, in fact, still running the White House. The savings and loan people, so I'm talking about all these double standards that they put out up there for us. This is the thing that bothers me. Now, what I know you are probably, when you go back to your jobs and you have a master plan, not that you're going to do tell this, but sometimes when your white friends and associates find out about this, you're going to get into serious trouble. So I've long since stopped caring about what they thought, because I would rather die on my feet than to live a hundred years crawling at their feet. And I have made that very, very clear. Because see, the things that I mentioned to you, white folks are going to tell you, oh, these things are happening to all people. Whenever they tell me that, I said, listen, whenever you people have a cold, we are suffering from pneumonia. Whenever you all have a disease, we have the same one, but ours is terminal. Whenever you organize a militia, they call them patriots. Whenever you organize the Aryans, they call you misguided youth. 
But whenever black folk organize, they send us a jail and call us that we're nationalists and we're insurrectionists and trying to overthrow the country. So don't ever begin to believe, no matter how good your jobs are, no matter what you're doing, that we are all one. Because this is the thing that they like to convince us, that there really is no difference. I don't know why we sit down on our shows and we'll tell people that, uh, what is her name, the Ricky Black Exploitation Lake Show that likes to get these people on there always saying that I don't think it matters who you marry and this kind of thing. But the reason why they can run this on us, did you know that everybody in their world can tell who their enemies are? Everybody in this world except black folks. You know, everybody else knows who their enemies are. But you know, we have this kind of thing that thou shalt not hold whatever these scriptures are. But you know, we really believe in that because we've had Baptist ministers since the days of the plantation, Methodist ministers, we've had ministers who've kept us in a prone position, kept, kept us on our knees, but never did say that the Lord or Allah helps those who help themselves. So most of these people understand who their enemies are, but we do not understand that we're the most forgiving people. Don't you know if you ask the Catholics who their enemies are, they'll tell you they don't have to do any research. It doesn't matter where they are, they can immediately tell you that at 2 a.m. in the morning. Ask the Jews who their enemies are, they'll call them for you. Ask the Palestinians, ask the Chinese, ask the President of the United States, he'll tell you. But we believe we have no enemies. We believe we have no enemies. Because if we believe we had something, it means we'd have to fight. And some of us are not willing to do that. If we believe that we had some enemies, then it means that we would have to stand for something. This is the kind of thing. But one of the major reasons that black folks refuse to recognize that they're enemies of our progress and enemies of our people is because we are too busy looking for approval. We are too busy looking for acceptance from these people. We, you know, we're too busy wanting, and you know, no matter what you do, you're never really going to, in a white supremacist society, for people who brought you over here, who deem that you're inferior, you will never ex accept, you'll never receive their approval or acceptance, and that's why I don't know why you seek it. The only thing that we should have them doing is fearing us, not accepting or doing these type things. This is what it is. But some of us will say, if we act out, it will hurt our image. Oh, what will white folk think? See, the Japanese aren't looking for acceptance, they're looking for superiority. The Koreans are not looking for acceptance, they're looking for superiority. The Russians, none of these groups are looking for acceptance from these people except us. Because you can believe this, all of these groups that I've named, the minute they get their superiority, don't expect them to be sympathetic either. They'll treat you just like the Europeans did. So when you decide to call yourself third world and all mixed up in coalitions with these people, you better watch and guard carefully who you coalesce with. So sisters, let me tell you, I think that if we're going to be looking at, at the 21st century, it is really time for us to go to war. I know this sounds terrible, but it is really time. The reason why I say that, some of you are so young, but you do not understand. 40 years ago, we were having these discussions. 20 years ago, we keep reinventing the wheel because we still have not understood that we were not put here to service the needs of white folks and to win their acceptance. And this is the kind of thing that bothers me. And when I say, if you're, when you, if you're ready to go to war, if you're ready to come with me, you may have to lose some friends, because you know, they're friends who don't want to be associated with people who make waves. You may have to lose some relatives, because I have lost a few. I have two sisters in Oakland, California, that are so bourgeois and such flag wavers that I only see them at funerals, hopefully at theirs. But these are the type things, you know, that we have to go through and have to deal with. And you are also going to lose some of your white friends, and I know that harms a lot of you that you have to lose those friends. But you will lose some of them if you decide to do that. But see, one of the things that we're going to have to do, we're going to have to move just as aggressively as these white women move. But the only difference is we will move aggressively with our men. Now see, they're moving with theirs, but they don't want you to believe that. They want you to believe they are oppressed by those men and that they do not have enough money. But when those men have a chance to hire somebody that they call a, quote, minority, who do they hire, them or us? They hire them because they'd rather hire their mothers and their sisters and their lovers than to hire their enemies, which we are deemed to be by them. But see, let me tell you what we're going to have to do. First, sisters, we've got to begin to have some very serious new racial strategies, which we have not had. We need a strategy that's just as Marcus Garvey said, the strategy needs to be race first. And when I say race first, I know a lot of you look up to those people who have not put race first. I think Shirley Chisholm is a wonderful person too. But when Sister Stanton said her oppression was more from being a female than being black, I said, now this is just the end. See, she can't be a part of the organization we're talking about. When Whoopi Goldberg said she had had worse treatment being a woman than she had ever had being black, and I know what part of a country she came from, and I know I've been treated black, but I said, this is just it. Uh, when Michael Jackson, well, maybe he didn't say he had more treatment being a woman, whatever he said. So you, you can understand 
The list goes down and down and down of what we may find out. And see, the only sisters that we should have, if we understand this, when we form our new organization, the sisters have to be black. They can't be women of color. They can't be multicultural. They can't be diverse. They can't be any of that thing. They got to be black. They got to be black women and identify themselves as that. They have got to do that. And first, I think we need to begin with an association of black women. Remember, I didn't say colored women's clubs, none of those things, the association of black women. Now, we can call ourselves African women if we want, but black women, it has to understand. And the only agenda that we have, it's not complex, is to free ourselves, free our men, and to free our children. You know, freeing the black, that's the only agenda. Now, that's not difficult. That is not any formula that you have to go home and memorize. It's just freedom is the only word you got to think. Freedom, race, and black. Those are my only things if you can remember to do that. And the reason why I say we have to begin to do that, the association that we form is not to be confused with any existing organization. We're not to be confused with the coalition of 100 black women, and I'm not going to even go there because you all know them to yourself. We have to do that. It's not going to be confused with the National Council of Negro Women because I'm afraid that we may become Bella Abzug sidekicks as they exist and they do right now. We're not going to call ourselves Jack and Jill because the organization that now calls it that is still confused with the nursery rhyme Jack and Jill's if you've ever seen them at any of their conventions and what they're doing. We're not going to call ourselves links because we are be looking for a linkage to Africa and these people don't want links to anything but acceptance by white folks and the white junior league, so we don't want that. We are not going to probably include the sororities because they think they are more Greek than they are African, as you all well know. We're not going to bother with the missionary societies of the churches because they don't know what to worship yet because they still have white allahs and white gods up on their walls, so we will not deal with that. We can't deal with organizations by former elected officials like C. Dolores Tucker who goes after our children for their language but doesn't bother white rappers like Vanilla Ice and people like that for all the language that they say. In other words, they can't have step. They can't be black Anglo-Saxons. And as I've told you before, black Anglo-Saxons are people who disidentify with black don't know who they are, some of you may be related to black Anglo-Saxons, some of you may know some, and some of you may even be a black Anglo-Saxon. Well, see, we don't have room for people like that. And when they come into our organization and they speak this kind of stuff, then we will refer them to other groups that they can go to because say, we're about freedom and liberation and we are very, very serious in what we have to do there. You see, if these groups that I just named were doing what I just said that we need to be doing, then we wouldn't even have to form anything new. But I'm afraid we got three years to get it done. In the new organization that we have, we would bring an outcry to anything that impinges on black folk as a group, not as individuals. And let me tell you how that can be done. Having worked for 10 years for Old Races ABC in San Francisco as a talk show host, I can tell you that the power that we have, and we just don't know the power that we have. We underestimate, we know our buying power, we know our consuming power, but we do not know the power that we have. Let me tell you the reason why we ought to be able to understand that first we work for the group, not for the individuals. If you look at a group of Asians, they may be Filipinos, they may be Chinese, they're Baptist, Methodist, they're all of those different religions. But when it comes time to come together, they come together as one. And the reason why they do that is because they have something called Confucianism that states that the group should come before the individual. It is not that we don't help individuals out, but individuals are too easily bought out. Sometimes they sell out, sometimes they die, sometimes they just get tired. And then when that happens, look what happens to our group. Though Brother Maddox is not here tonight, you can tell that this organization will still survive. So we, this is how our organizations have to go and we have to deal with that. And let me tell you something else that we would do. We would show up on issues, again, that would affect the masses of black people, not just individuals. Did you know, and I, you probably know who Denise Brown is, the one down there who just got a $1 million contract. You know, I never knew the trash could get all this money without at least picking up some trash. But anyway, she, uh, they are now, she has a group of white females and a few black tokens in the group in Los Angeles getting ready to recall the judge that gave O.J. Simpson his children back. Now, let me tell you why black women come in. Now, I've had black women say, oh, we don't, uh, not interested in O.J. Simpson. I don't think we ought to be. It's not about him. We don't even need to know the name of the judge. But what it means is that if you can take his children away, then any time we do something, that same group will be in to take our children away, and we will not have the money to be able to recall them. That's why I'm saying, see, it takes us 
Every time a black male tries to go up against some of these things that are going on with a black female, with a white female and a white a male, sometimes they're arrested. But I think we can meet them head on and do some of these type things. I think as black women face in the 21st century, and our organization is going to have to look at something else. We should not have rushed out there so quickly to embrace Bill Clinton, who turned his back on us when he signed that welfare bill. He signed that welfare bill because he too thought that he was really getting back at us, that we were the majority. Because every time I think of AFDC, I know it means aid for dependent corporations. But the reason why we were so happy to be a part of this after he signed the bill, turned his back on us, some of us were so busy grinning and skinning with him, hoping we would get a chance to sleep in, the Lincoln's, uh, in Lincoln's bed in the White House or Hillary's bed or somebody's bed in there. We thought we would get a chance to do that. So we didn't do anything about that. We were hoping that he would probably name one black person to the cabinet. And what difference has one black person to the cabinet ever made to black people? You know that. When they got rid of, 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 of the one, what's his name over the fried chicken, uh, Tyson, the Secretary of the Agriculture. I mean, that has not impounded upon us at all. We're still eating and buying chicken wherever we get a chance to get it. So we know this can happen. I'm also seeking sisters who are willing to be risk takers. See, most of us are just not willing to take a risk of doing anything like that. See, we need to be out there as black mothers, black grandmothers, black aunts, challenging a judicial system that told us they're going to put us in jail if we discipline our children told us that they're going to put us in jail if we discipline our children. Did you know as a psychologist, I see them every day when I go to court, when the judges are white, everybody in there is white but the bailiffs and Julia, taking the children away because if you look at them hard, you're accused of psychological abuse. And God forbid should you take them out to the backyard and get a switch off that peach tree and put it on their legs. They're taking black children away. And they're taking them away, sometimes putting them in white homes, paying them $18,000 a month, tax-free per child from your children because you discipline them. Black women, we ought not to allow this kind of thing to happen, and we should just go down and tell those judges that we don't discipline our children when they're three. You don't say nothing about the cops disciplining them when they're 16 or when they're riding the king's age. But see, we sit by and allow this to happen. And so now I have people who are coming to the clinic if the child has just a sore shoulder or anything. My child fell, but I'm afraid that if I take my child to the doctor, the doctor may take him away. We need to stop that on behalf of our sisters who do not know how to go down there and speak for themselves. You look at the public school system, just like we came out here tonight, we need to, as black women in our organization, go up there, and the first thing we need to do, if the, if the student body is predominantly black, and most of the teachers are white, we need to correct that and ship those white teachers out to the suburban areas where they can teach their own children or miseducate their own kids. Because as long as they're there teaching our children, you know what they're doing? When they see the black boy and they don't understand the cultural differences, when they see the slapping of the hands of the backward caps or the jeans down or whatever it is, they're putting them in special ed classes. And they're now, and you know, once you get in special ed class, you're on a track. This is what they're doing now to the young black child. They're giving them Ritalin to keep them still. They're giving them that. They're probably sneaking, taking some of it themselves so that they can kind of control them. They're doing this kind of thing. And now you have, out in my area, the, the Oakland school teachers have now listened to the Association of Linguists, and there are 6,000 of them, they're white. They are now going to teach white teachers, pay thousands of dollars, how to understand Ebonics. I said, but it would be cheaper for you to ship them to the suburb and let them teach Ebonics to their own children, the European language that they know, and you bring black people in here who also understand the language. Because any black person there who does not understand that, this is it. In other words, they are not putting our children. Our children are not dropping out of school. They're being pushed out. And I'm thinking that as the mothers, we are the ones who can go up and help this and stop this thing from going about. Now, I know a lot of us believe that we have made it. I can just hear us now saying, oh, I'm a principal of my local school. Oh, I have been a teacher. You know, they look up to teachers in our community. I'm an elected official, and I get a chance to sit and have breakfast with the mayor once a month. I am the fire chief. I'm the first one they've had. And, you know, some of us just have just completely sold out. I heard some brothers up at Harvard the other day who were saying that, well, you know, uh, I was chosen to, be, to show how a black studies program should operate. This is your friend, Skip Gates. Uh, this was the other, Shemillion, uh, Carnell West. Oh, I was chosen also to do the other thing. And then the other one, William Julius Wilson, who wrote The Declining Significance of Race. I told him, I said, I guess it is declining every night that you recline with your white wife. So I said, these are the type of things that were going down. And so I'm saying, these are the people that we need to begin to challenge. But see, we begin to believe that we have it made. And when we start to think that we have it made, we do not understand that we are only a few steps from the oven like those other people are really a few steps from slavery. They said, we're not really that far from that. 
because unless your unity and your goals and your agendas are together, you have a problem. And let me tell you why we're not too far from slavery. Uh, taking the welfare away is a way of putting you back in slavery. This is what this is. The, the welfare is not paying you anything now, but they know you really would have to crawl with the pennies they give you. Taking the affirmative action away knows that this is a problem of putting you back on the plantations and that this time the plantations will be concrete where you have to steal and rob from everybody. Non-race-based tuitions is another way of sending us back to the plantations. Downsizing, which corporations are doing all the time, saying that we have too many here, and you know it's the last hired will be the first fired out of there, with IBM leading the groups, but I still see brothers and sisters, oh, I work for IBM. I said, do you understand that IBM stands for I be moved? And so we see all of these various things that are going down, the building of the prisons and all of this stuff that they're doing, and all of this has a direct impact upon black folks, but sometimes we sit still and believe it and nothing is happening. But I think that one of our major problems is that, as black folks, we have always, one of the slickest things you can run on a people is to give them the illusion of having made it. You know we have a lot of black folks who really believe that they're free. They really believe that they have made it. You know, they really believe, well, I have no problems getting along. Uh, I, I, I've made it very well. How come you don't pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Last time a brother told me that, I said, listen, I knew you in Oklahoma when you didn't own any boots. But tell, you're telling people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So they give us the illusion. They give us titles. The assistant secretary to this. The, the, the chief security guard. You know, in other words, protecting their interests. Making us supervisors of ourselves. A, a, a 20th century technical terms for straw bosses. They give us these things to make us really believe that we've done that. And the more we become assimilated into this thing, the weaker we become, the more integrated we become into this kind of thing, and the more dependent we become. Have you noticed we have more psychologists and social workers now than we've ever had, and our people appear to be a little crazier than they've ever been? You know, we have all of this stuff that's out there. We have more uh, economists and CPAs than we've ever had, and yet we have more poverty and more people without food than we've ever had. So I'm saying that the more we integrate into somebody else's sense of power, the worse it becomes for us. So sisters, I'd like for us to do one thing. I'd like for us to see in our new organization, if we could begin seeing ourselves, begin seeing black people as a business. Did you know everybody else sees us as a business? Everybody, and our business is not about making the dollar. Our business is about liberation, but we need to begin to see that. I was in Detroit and the sisters and brothers were very disturbed because they said the Arabs are now supplying the liquors from the inner city stores. I said, there's one thing about it, you don't have to go in there. Oh, but it would be very inconvenient to go three, uh, four uh, miles out of the way. I said, freedom is costly, but ignorance is even more costly. So I said, if this is the kind of thing that you want to do, this is what you have to do. Uh, when I it, uh, down Harlem, I was noticing and reading that I saw a lot of Koreans and a lot of, of white folks on the main drag that 125th Street. I said, now we got to look at that to see what is happening here. I know some of you are saying, but the banks will give them loans and they will not give us loans. That's true. But the banks are not going to go there to shop. All we have to do is to stay out of those stores. They would have to go into foreclosure, and then some of us would have to take over those stores. When I was in Miami, they were furious because the Cubans now were speaking to them, I mean, with attitudes, having screens up where the children could not buy their things, had taken over all the businesses in the community, so they were very, very disturbed. And the same thing with, in Houston with the Indo-Chinese. Then when I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just a couple of days ago, just a couple, some new people had moved into the area, I believe they were Arabs, and they called their store Hood. But the people in the community really thought that maybe they were Asians and that was their last name. The man came out and said, no, 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 I mean neighborhood. And you know, this whole company now have called the store the Hood, have getting this money from all the black people and then running back out to where they are. I tell you black women, if you live in a house, if you live in a condominium, if you live in an apartment, if you live in a shoe, there ought to be something that's in that house that is generating an income for you, your family, and your community. You ought to use some space in that house. I don't care if you're baking, if you're sewing, if you're cooking. There ought to be an area in there where that place is paying for itself, where you are free to use your energies to do something else. Remember, it was Marcus Garvey who told us about being about institution building, but more importantly, it was Booker T. Washington who saw us going downtown with full baskets every Saturday, with empty carts, bringing them back full. He said, if you're going to go downtown and shop with the white folks, you need to take a full cart and bring it back empty. And this is the kind of thing we haven't done. We should be peddling our wares all over here, not just in our community. Take them on down to areas where nobody's peddling any words. You'd be surprised at the kind of money that you would make from that. 
As we begin to face the 21st century, I hope we will see ourselves as a business in all of these, these private prison programs that you know that American Express and all of them are now taking them over. And by taking over these, these, these prisons, you know they're now selling shares and their stockholders are now getting their money back. And who do you think they're going to put in them? They're in there for us. It is nothing but enslavement. And finally, I call upon you sisters to help our men get rid of the blues for Snow White. The reason why you're going to have to get rid of that black men, you just saw the black drill sergeants now that are having difficulty in the war because some, some white women, as usual, this is just a playback from three, four hundred years ago, had accused them of rape and the whole kind of thing, and now they later come out talking about consensual sex. You need to leave her alone. And let me tell you, if you don't want, if you don't want to go in the harlot's house, don't go near the harlot's door. Because I'm going to tell you, that would be lent to see some of you did not learn from O.J. Simpson, just did not learn the lesson. And our famous sisters, who are the famous stars, we're going to have to tell the rest of them that too. We're going to have to just tell them sisters, them Diana Rosses and all, that the money belongs here in our community instead of spreading it with these people. Same thing, we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to understand that we need a rites of passage for our black boys and girls, so we have to stop worrying about their miseducation because we will know how to do that because that teaches us how to respect male-female relationships and the things to do. We're going to have to understand about why we have a crisis in black male-female relationships because this is one of the reasons why we did the book How to Find and Keep a BMW Black Man Working. I was tired to death of seeing good-looking, successful sisters like this and these in this room, brother. They had good jobs. They were raising babies, and they would come in to us. They would come into our clinic and they would say that they were a little bit depressed, that there were some things they wanted to do. And after talking to them for a while, I found that the depression was not from the job. They had very good jobs. They said that they wanted certain type things. And finally, I got the clue when the one lady said, but I'd like to have a BMW. I said, you work for a corporation, you can buy any kind of car you want. She said, no, Julia, I need a black man working. And see, with these type things that went down, I have started to find out what the problem was. But sisters, one of the things we're going to have to do is stop overlooking good black men that are working. One of the things that we have done for years, we have looked for what we call the most successful black male. That may be someone on Wall Street with the briefcase. Brother may not have anything in there but a peanut butter sandwich. But see, we'll be looking at them. I have been saying, stop overlooking, stop overlooking the blue collar man. Because the blue collar brother believes in paying his markets, believes in paying his taxes, believes in sending his children to school, and some of them are so good because they seek your approval, the blue collar brother will do just like Charles Brown, will have you get up on Christmas morning singing to your friends, I haven't had a drink this morning, but I'm all lit up like a Christmas tree. So you got these type things that are gone, so stop looking over them. I tell the college girls, start looking at the nerds. Why would I want someone nobody else wants? I said, because you can train what you want. And I said, these are very important situations that you have to begin to look at very, very carefully. So we started to break down. This is how we do that. Some people are saying that we need to look into the whole program of man sharing. Well, you know, folks have been man sharing and woman sharing for years. But we do not have to sanction this kind of thing because I want you to know that the shortage of black males is not an accident. As my husband Nathan Hare wrote in Crisis in Black Sexual Politics, that is not an accident. It was created there because they said if we could destroy the male, then we will destroy the black family because then we cannot reproduce and there will be no reproductive devices. These are the type of things that are going on. Sisters, I would hope that you would help us in looking at the homicide now that is on the increase between the brothers and sisters. There is no reason. The reason why the homicide is on the increase, our rage is misplaced. Brothers, when you come home and you've had a bad day, sisters, not the punching bag. Sister, when something has happened to you and the man is not really moving up as fast as he can on the job, because you remember we live in a patriarchal society, and the patriarch of the ruling class will move the patriarch of the oppressed class up as slowly as possible if he moves him at all. But remember that if you must fight, as one of our writers at the Black Think Tank has often said, remember, if there is a fight in the kitchen, it is the man who's going to come up as the victim. If the fight is in the bedroom, it is the woman who comes up with the victim. So if y'all must fight, choose where you fight. So that you'll know what comes out of this thing and where they're going to come out. And I want you not to forget, if you possibly can, our brothers and sisters of the families that are here of imprisoned people. See, sometimes when somebody dies in the family, we all go over to them and we wish them our condolences and we do everything we can. But when a family is suffering with people in prison, they need your exact support. We need to be helping them finding out if they got rights to get up to where they're going and the whole kind of thing. 
Now, I know it seems like that is difficult for you to get all of this stuff done at one time. I know it appears difficult that we have an ominous task before us, but there's never, three years has never been too long for a black woman to do anything that she wanted to do. Am I right? There's anything that we wanted to get done. We know. And we are used to having struggles, we're used to having obstacles. Because our grandmothers told us a long time ago there are three kinds of black women. There are those who make it happen, there are those who watch it happen, and there are those who don't know what happened. Well, I choose to believe that at the United African Movement, we're talking about those who can make it happen, am I right? And I know sometimes, sometimes it doesn't always get together for us, but that's okay. You just have to set a goal of what you're going to do. Every one of you need to know what you're going to do when you leave here tonight. At least we may not make it, but we can plan it. You need to know what you're going to do tomorrow. You know what you need to know what you're going to be doing Easter, Sunday, Kwanzaa, whenever the time comes. And it's okay if you miss it because one person told us that the tragedy in life does not lie in not achieving your goals. The tragedy lies in having no goals to achieve. So as long as you keep the goals in mind, you can do that. And sisters, as we work with our brothers, not against them, as we work with our brothers and brothers as you work with us, brothers as you decide and understand that there is no shortage of sisters, that any time that you want to be with a real woman, then you must look at those who looked like your mother. Because when you look at others, it means that you have denied her. So I'm saying that any time that we move forward and we know that we can move together, there are going to be people who talk about us. There were people who put you out of a slave theater, but what did we do? Aren't we here? There are some who moved you from the Baptist church, but now aren't we here? There may even be some that try to move us out of here, but aren't we there? Well, won't we find another place to go? And this just lets us know that we can tell the organization and those people and that religious group that's trying to run you all over New York and will try to run you out. You can tell them that Julia Harris said, as a sister, chartered member, as a sister from across the country, who is also a sister of the United African Movement, I'm going to be running right along with you to let you understand that if we stumble or if we fall, I'm going to say, sisters, if we fall, try to fall on our backs. Because if we can look up, we can get up. as they had. What say you about that 400 years later? It is amazing that uh, black relationships have lasted for 400 years. They lasted this morning. They're also going to last tonight, and you may not even know the person to whom you're going to have the relationship with. <laughs> but they do tend to go over. Relationships do go over like that. And as we move into what has happened to this, I know that our relationships sometimes really reach a low ebb. That's one of the reasons why we wrote the book, How to Find and Keep a BMW, a Black Man Working, that was spelled out in there. It's just very serious. Because relationships, our relationships didn't start yesterday or last week. It also started 400 years ago when those 19 persons were here. And I want you to remember something very important that one of our by any means necessary power brokers told us, and that was Malcolm X. He said, if we can only remember that you didn't land at Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on you. And it's very essential that we kind of keep this in place. And knowing that these are the things that happen, then we have to move more to change it. See, we have a system that would not like to see black males and black females together. They would not like to see that happening at all. Because once we come together, they understand the power of the strength of the black woman, the queen of the universe. They know that, her strength. They also know, they also know the power of the black male, the warrior. If you would turn him loose, he will protect also his family and things that need to be done. And because they understand that if our relationships are together, then they will lose. But if our relationships are torn up, then we can forever be treated in certain ways by the oppressors. That's why they gave us something called integration, which is nothing but the illusion of inclusion. They gave us this. They actually gave this statement. And when they gave that statement, it meant that they could go right into your homes. They went into the black homes now, the powers that be, and told us that you cannot discipline your children anymore. And if you discipline your children, you will go into jail. It's this kind of thing they told us. Now, this is amazing that, you know, the black uh, parents who in Africa, that was out of the question. Some social worker come in there saying you can't discipline your children, the social worker would disappear. As you all know, this kind of thing would go on. You would be sitting in a place like this and all you had to do was act up and do something wrong and all your mother had to do was to glance in your direction. Y'all remember that? 
And you remember that the glance men don't let me have to get up and come over there. And every once in a while in the black family, there was a fool who would challenge the glance. And if you could get home over the foot, over the ironing cart, over whatever, you were sent to the backyard to get something off the peach tree. And if you brought something in that was too short, God forbid that you would do something like that. But then it got so terrible in frightening us. This is why we got to take this back. And this is the best part of our action plan is to reclaim the minds of our children because then they went into the public schools and took discipline out of there. So when we acted up in there, they put our boys, our black men, into something called special ed classes. And as you know, those special ed classes are nothing but holding cells until they can go to the state prison. The one thing that they knew that if we can put them in prison, if we can have them convicted for a felony, then once they get out of prison, they cannot get a job because of that. They cannot get the job. And then if they happen to eke out and find a job, then they have to pay taxes on a job, yet they cannot vote, and I call that... call that taxation without representation. That's what we're looking at. And if one of the things that we would learn to do, they did a grand thing when they took that discipline away from us, because when they made our parents afraid to discipline the children, then what happened? We found out that the teachers were afraid of the principals, the principals were scared of the superintendents, superintendent was scared of the school board, school board was scared of the parents, parents were scared of the children, and the children ain't scared of nobody. statement, the reason why we're so pleased to have the covenant, it makes all of this type of foolishness stop. It's going on under Angela Glover in San Francisco. It's all over the country. And they're all saying, we finally have a movement where we can take back over the minds of our children. And the first thing we got to take over, the covenant taught us that we do not have to have black leaders anymore. It told us because everyone in this room is empowered to be a black leader. The one in this room. Because, because see, right now, right now, these people that you're calling black leaders are not what they used to be with Marcus Garvey's day. They're not what they used to be back in the days of W.E.B. Du Bois or Martin Luther King. Those were the people that got us together and planted a strategy, and we're not looking for fame. But today's black leaders, I'm afraid, have become leading blacks. And don't ever confuse leading blacks with black leaders. Let me tell you why you don't do that. One of the reasons you don't confuse them, black leaders are chosen by you. They're chosen by the people they're going to lead. They're chosen by us. But let me tell you about the leading blacks. The leading blacks are chosen by the media. Leading blacks, 
Leading blacks are chosen by ABC, all broadcasting Caucasians. Should I, should I, should, should, should I, should I stop her or let her go? are also chosen by NBC. Nothing broadcasting but Caucasians. <laughs> and the rest are chosen by CBS, the Caucasian Broadcasting System. <laughs> and when you allow, when you allow leaders to be chosen by the media that's owned by the corporations, when you get ready to change your lives, when you get ready to demonstrate, when you get ready to march, when you get ready to come to the covenant, when you get ready to endorse and make a, a Tavis one of our next elected officials, but what happens? <laughs> then you must take the time to carefully watch and see what the leading blacks are doing because that's when the leading blacks sneak into the door to the corporations and they will tell the corporations oh we know how to go and put them down we know how to get you some real affirmative action negroes to come in here and work we know how to do that but at the end of the day the leading blacks lead the corporations and the leading blacks have gotten paid while we have gotten played